This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory. And this lecture will be about primes. So I'll just recall definition of a prime. First of all, um, we define it for positive integers. So a prime p is an integer greater than 1, not divisible by anything um, except 1 and p. So, of course, we know the first few primes are 2, 3, 5, 7, and so on. Um, the no letter p is um, often used for prime numbers. p obviously stands for prime. Um, notice, by the way, that um, we have this condition p has to be greater than 1. 1 is not prime. And the reason it's not prime is that I've defined it not to be prime. And the reason I've defined it not to be prime is that it turns out to be very convenient to have one not count as a prime for reasons we will see fairly soon. Um, not all mathematicians agree with this. Um, there was a mathematician called Lehner who used to um, compute primes a lot, and he sort of annoyed all other mathematicians by counting one as a prime. So he would produce counts of the number of primes less than a million or a billion or whatever, and his counts were always off by one with everybody else's count because he thought one should be a prime. Um, so that's a prime if you're talking about positive integers. There's an alternative definition where we allow um, negative integers. Um, so here we want minus 2, minus 3, and minus 5, and so on, to count as primes. And here we would say a prime um, is an integer um, p not equal 0, such that if p equals a, b, then a or b is a unit. A unit is something that has an inverse. And the only units for the integers are just 1 and minus 1. Um, for more general rings, sometimes we will allow other things to be units. In fact, we will see a few examples of this a bit later. And let's start by recalling um, simple ways to test for primes. Um, so um, suppose we want to test some number, say 101 is prime. We just need to check all the numbers, 2, 3, up to 100, these do not divide 101. Well, that's kind of stupid because um, we can simplify this a bit. First of all, we only need to check um, primes because if it's divisible by, say, 6, then it would have to be divisible by one of the prime factors of 6. Another way to speed it up is we only need to check numbers less than or equal to the square root of 101. That's because if 101 equals a, b, and a, b are both greater than the square root of 101, then a times b would be greater than 101, which is a contradiction. So we only need to check numbers up to the square root. So we just need to check 2, 3, 5, and 7, because these are the um, prime factors less than the square root of 101, and you can easily check it's not divisible by any of these. So we can easily see that 101 is prime. Um, you can see the number of steps for this is going to be roughly bounded by about the square root of whatever number we're checking. So if we're checking n to be prime, then we're going to need to check about the square root of n numbers. Well, a, a bit less than that, because we only need to check primes, but whatever, this gives a crude bound. So for numbers n up to about a 1,000 or up to about a billion, if you've got a computer, this is quite reasonable. This is too slow if n is large. And if n is a really large number, say it has 100 digits or something, you, you wouldn't use this, this test because it's too slow. Well, actually, you would use this test um, part of the way because um, we, we have some fast ways to check whether numbers are primes. But they take a long time to warm up. Um, and, you know, b b before trying one of these heavyweight 
test. What you should do is try the easy test. So you check n to see if it's divisible by two or three or five, because these are really fast tests to do. And if you've got a computer, you, you you, you, you might, for example, check that n isn't divisible by any prime up to a million or so before starting one of these um, more complicated tests. So, 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 so checking a few small primes, checking a number for divisibility by a few small primes is nearly always a good thing to do when you first come across a number. Um, now we have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, which says that any number n, if n is greater than or equal to 1, n is a product of primes, uh, a product of a finite set of primes in a unique way. Well, it's not quite unique op op because 2 times 3 is equal to 3 times 2. So we say a unique way op to order. And you may think you thought of an obvious counterexample because you might say that n equals 1 is not a product of primes. But I will, I will say, say sort of note that um, 1 is a product of the empty set of primes because by convention the product of an empty set of numbers is taken to be 1 in much the same way that the sum of an empty set of numbers is taken to be 0. So, and it's, it's actually very convenient to have this convention about the product of an empty set of primes being 1. It makes several theorems rather easier to state. Um, so um, that, that, that's a product of primes for positive integers. Um, there's an alternative version if you allow positive and negative integers where you'd say if n is not equal to naught n is a product of primes. Here we allow primes to be possibly negative in a, a unique way up to, first of all, order, and secondly, up to units. Um, and um, it's actually not quite correct to say it's a product of primes in a unique way because minus one isn't actually a product of primes. So, so what you have to do is remember to say it's a product of primes and a unit. And it's in a unique way up to order and units. So you can have two times three is equal to three times two, which is equal to minus two times minus three and so on. Um, so uh, these two versions are pretty obviously equivalent. I'm just going to prove this version here, and the, and the second version follows follows immediately. Um, so um, the, the proof is in two parts. There's an easy part, which is existence of um, a factorization n equals p, q, r, and so on, where these are primes. And there's a hard part, which is uniqueness, which says that this is unique up to order. Um, so let's do the easy part. Let's take a number n. If n greater than or equal to 1, if n equals 1 or n prime, then we're done, because it's a product of an empty set of primes or a product of just one prime. Um, um, if not, otherwise, n is equal to a, b, where a and b are both greater than 1 and less than n, because um, um, if you can't write n like this, then it must either be 1 or a prime, more or less by definition of a prime. So by induction, A is a product of primes, P1, P2, and so on, and B is a product of primes, you know, Q1, Q2, and so on. That's because these numbers are less than n, so we can apply our inductive hypothesis about every number being a product of primes. And so, obviously, n is equal to P1, P2, and so on, times Q1, Q2, and so on. So, by induction on the integers, we've shown that every integer is, every positive integer is a product of of primes. Now we've got to do the hard part. Uniqueness. Um, 
And here we need a, a key property of prime. So this is the key step. Suppose P is prime. And suppose P divides A times B. Then P divides A or P divides B. So this, this is what this is the central key result we need in order to prove uniqueness. So how do we prove this? Well, suppose P does not divide A. Then the greatest common divisor of A and P is equal to 1 as P is prime. You know, P is prime, so the only possible divisors of P are 1 in itself, and we've just assumed it doesn't divide A. So the only number that can divide A and P is 1. So by Euclid, AX plus PY is equal to 1 for some integers X and Y. Um, and um, now we multiply by B. So BAX plus BP y is equal to b. Um, well, p divides this, and it divides a b because we assumed it divides a b. And p obviously divides this because p divides p, so p divides b, which is what we're trying to prove. We've shown that if p doesn't divide a, then it must divide b. Um, so um, with this key step, it's now easy to prove uniqueness. So let's suppose P, um, so let's suppose N is equal to P1, P2, and so on, a product of primes. And suppose this is also equal to Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. Then P1 divides Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on. And now we show that if P1 divides a product of two numbers, then it must divide one of them. And obviously you can just sort of repeat this by induction and show that if a prime divides any product of numbers, then it must equal, then it must divide one of them. So P1 divides QI for some I. But then QI is prime. So P1 equals QI. And now what we can do is we can just go back and um, we, we, P1 is uh, there's some QI here, and we can just cross off P1 and QI from the factorization and repeat. So we sort of repeat this after dividing by P1 equals QI. So the factorization is unique up to order. Uh, of course, we, we, we can't insist on the order because P1 doesn't necessarily divide Q1. It just has to divide one of these. Um, so um, this proof of uniqueness of factorization into primes is more or less in Euclid's Elements of Mathematics written more than 2,000 years ago. Um, he didn't quite state it, and the, the, the reason is that, that, that Greek mathematical notation was so clumsy that it was actually really difficult to even state the um, product state that n can be written as a product of primes. The, the trouble is the Greek no, notion of multiplication was a, was a, was a bit tricky. Um, I mean, you know, they, they, they tended to represent numbers as line segments, and you can multiply two line segments to get an area and three line segments to get a volume, but, you know, if, if you haven't yet discovered four dimensions, it's a bit difficult to do a product of four numbers geometrically. So, um, so what did Euclid do? Well, what Euclid did was he proved the key step here. He proved that if P is a prime and divides AB, then it divides A and it divides B. And that's, that's the hard part of proving the fundamental theorem of algebra. So, so Euclid is sort of credited with proving this theorem because he gave the essential hard part of the proof. Um, um, we can also give um, a similar result for polynomials. 
over, say, the reals or any other field. Um, so if you've got a polynomial f of x is a0 plus a1x and so on, then um, we can talk about polynomials being prime if you can't write them as a product of polynomials of smaller degree. Note, notice here the units are the constant polynomials um, that, that, that are not identically zero. So the, the, the result here says that any polynomial, any non-zero polynomial, can be written as a product of um, irreducible polynomials and constant polynomials, and this is unique up to order and multiplying everything by, by constants. Um, I'm not going to give the proof of this. You more or less just copy the proof I gave for the integers. Um, now I want to give some examples to show why we actually need to prove this and why it's not entirely obvious. Um, so, for example, um, you, you can ask a similar result in any collection of objects that you can multiply. So we can multiply integers. So. Um, we can define primes and talk about unique factorization. If you've got any other collection of objects you can multiply, you can again try and define primes as things that can't be factorized and so on. So, so let's look at some cases. Suppose we look at the reals that are greater than or equal to 1. Again, you can multiply two reals that are greater than or equal to 1 and you will get another real. And there's one unit which is 1. And what would a prime be? Well, a prime would be something that can't be written as a product of two things that aren't units. But the trouble is, if you take any real, you can write it as the product of the square root of a times itself. That's any real greater than 1. So there are no analogues of primes. Let's put primes in inverted commas. So here, you can't write a, a real number greater than 1 as a product of a unit and primes, whereby units and primes, we, we, we adjust the definition for the, for, for the reals greater than or equal to 1. Um, uh, a similar example, well, well the, the, the reals are sort of continuous in, in some sense. It, it, and um, we can ask, can, can we do something like this for, for things that are discrete? Well, here now let's take the integers 1, 5, 9, 13, 17, um, 21, and so on. So these are the integers of the form 4n plus 1. And notice you can multiply them because 4n plus 1 times 4m plus 1 is equal to is equal to 4 times mn plus m, sorry, 4mn plus m plus n plus 1. So here we can multiply these integers, and you can ask, what are the primes here? Well, this one is, number 1 is obviously just a unit, and 5 is prime, and 9 is prime. I mean, you can multiply 9 as 3 by 3, but that doesn't count because you're only laying numbers that are 1 mod 4. So, so, so these are all primes. 21 is again prime, but 25 is not prime, um, and 29 is prime again, and so on. So um, 25 is not prime because it's 5 times 5, and similarly 45 would count as not prime. So we have an analogue of primes, and we can, we can write every number is indeed a product of primes. And I'm going to write primes in inverted commas because I'm talking about these funny primes where I'm counting 21 and 9 as being prime. However, th this is not unique. And the problem is, um, we, 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 we can do things like 9 um, times 49 is equal to 21 times 21. And 9, 49, 21, and 21 are all primes in this funny sense. So here we get a non-unique factorization. Um, of course, if we allow integers that are 3 mod 4, then 9 becomes 3 times 3, and this becomes 7 times 7, and this becomes 3 times 7, and this becomes 3 times 7. So. Um, we restore unique factorization if you add the numbers that are 3 mod 4. Um, so anyway, the, the, the point of this example shows that you actually have to do some sort of non-trivial proof that ordinary integers can be written as a product of prime. So you've got to eliminate some sort of weird case like this going on. Um, well, the trouble with these two examples, you could say the 
the, the reals greater than or equal to 1 and these numbers are not actually closed under addition and subtraction. So can we find examples with addition and subtraction where we don't get uniqueness? And the answer is yes. So, so, so let's look at, say, functions on the reals that are greater than or equal to 0. And here we can multiply them and add them and subtract them pointwise. But if you look at the function x, you can see x is equal to root of x squared and root of x is equal to the fourth root of x all squared and the fourth root of x is equal to the eighth root of x all squared and so on. So you can keep on splitting this function into a product of smaller and smaller things and, and none of these are units. So there's no way to write this as a sort of product of prime functions because we can always split the function as a product of two smaller things. So we can't write functions as a product of... I mean, the, the, if, if you're looking at fun, general functions on the reals, there's no good concept of a prime function that you can write all functions as a product of. Um, another example, um, let's take all numbers of the form m plus n times the square root of minus 5 when m and n are integers. This is an example of something called an algebraic number field and a lot of number theory can be extended from the integers to algebraic number fields. However, one thing that can't be extended in this case is unique factorization because we can see that 6 is 2 times 3 and it's also 1 plus root minus 5 times 1 minus root minus 5. And this gives two different factorizations of 6, and they don't differ from each other by units, and you, you can't write either of these as a product of, of non-units. So, um, so there's no uniqueness of factorization in this case. Um, incidentally, we will see later on that m plus n, I think numbers of the form n plus root minus 1, do have unique factorization into primes. Um, these are called the Gaussian integers, and we will later adapt Euclid's proof to show that it can be extended to these as well. Here are the units, by the way, are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus i, which is root minus 1. So it, it has slightly more units than the integers. Um, so in some sense, we're quite lucky that the integers do have unique factorization. I mean, we could easily have ended up with the integers behaving like these numbers here, which would make life a lot more difficult. Um, next, um, we, we'll have um, Euclid's proof that there are infinitely many primes. Um, I discussed this in the first lecture, so I'll just quickly recall it. So you remember what we do is if we've got any finite set of primes, P1 up to Pn, what we do is we just multiply them together and add 1. And what we do is we take a new prime P that divides this. And then we notice that P is not equal to P1, P2 up to Pn, because if it was P1, say, then it would have to divide it would, it would divide this, and it would also divide this, so it would have to divide 1, which is nonsense. So, P is a new prime. So, um, so there are infinitely many primes. Well, well, Euclid didn't actually say there are infinitely many primes because he didn't like the concept of infinity. So what he said is that for any finite set of primes, you can find another prime not in that set which is um, another way of saying that. Well, of course, he didn't use the word set because set theory hadn't been invented, but whatever. Um, um, as I said in the first lecture, there's a common mistake that some people think that P1 up to Pn plus 1 is always prime, and you can easily check that it isn't. I mean, let, let's do the first few cases. First of all, we take the product of the empty set of primes, which is 1 and add 1, and we get 2. Then we take the product of all the primes we found, 2, and add 1, which is 3. Then we take 2 times 3 plus 1, which is 7. And we take 2 times 3 times 7 times uh, plus 1, which is 43. And then we take 2 times 3 times 7 times 43 plus 1. And, um, and this time we get 1807, and this factors as 13 times 139. So... Um, 
We don't always get primes. We, we really do sometimes get this number that factorizes. Um, there's something you might wonder about. What happens if instead of taking 2 times 3 times 7 times 43, you just take all the first few primes, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 11 or whatever, and add 1? Is this always a prime? See, it looks as if it's got a much bigger chance than normal of being prime because it's obviously not divisible by all these small primes. So these numbers are certainly more likely than most numbers to be primes in a sense. However, um, even these are not prime. Um, we should check the first few cases and just see what happens. So you take 2 times 1, that's obviously prime. 2 times 3 plus 1, that's 7, that's prime. 2 times 3 times 5 plus 1. 31, 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 plus 1, well that gives you 211, that's still prime. Um, um, however, if you get 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 11 plus 1, that's again um, 2, 3, 1, 1, that's again prime. If you take 2 times 3 times 5 times 7 times 11 times 13 plus 1, this is um, 30031, and this actually splits as 59 times 509. So the reason I'm doing this is to sort of emphasize that number theory is really a rather experimental subject. Whenever you've got a question like, um, is a product of the first few primes plus one is prime? The first thing you do is just calculate the first dozen or so examples and see what happens. And, and quite often you will, you will be able to answer your question by um, just doing a bit of calculation. We can have another question. Suppose you take Euclid's, Euclid's method of generating primes. So we get, you remember, we get 2, 3, then we've got 7, then we've got 43, then we've got 13, and so on. And you can ask, do we get all primes appear in this list? Um, and this is actually an incredibly difficult question. Well, in some sense, it's a very easy question because it's easy to see that the answer is almost certainly yes. And the answer is almost certainly. And the reason for this is as follows. Suppose we take some prime, say, does 101 appear? And let me try and convince you that it's almost certain that 101 appears without actually doing any calculation. So the, the chance that it appears at step n is about 1 over 101 because um, we're dividing a sort of random number by 101 and the chance that a random number is divisible by 101 is about 1 in 101 because there are 100 possible one sorts of remainders. So the chance that it does not appear at step n is about 1 minus 1 over 101. So the chance that it does not appear at step less than or equal to n is about 1 minus 101 to the power of n. And you can make this as small as you like by making n sufficiently large. So if you take n to be a million, this will be a ridiculously small number. So it's almost certain that 101 appears um, in the first million numbers. Um, so this is a bit like saying, you know, suppose you toss a coin a million times, what's the, you know, it, it's very unlikely that it's going to turn up heads every time. And, and similarly, um, if you threw a dice with 101 faces, if you threw it three or four times, you probably wouldn't get a 101 once. But if you threw it millions of times, it, it's as certain as almost anything can be that, 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 that um, this number is going to turn up somewhere. So the number 101 almost certainly appears. It's very hard to imagine how it couldn't appear. And the same obviously applies to any other number. So this strongly suggests that all primes do in fact appear. However, this seems to be almost impossible to prove. Um, you see, we're, we're saying these numbers are random. Um, well, the trouble is they're not random. They're, they're, they're produced by this, you know, Euclid's method and you know, there's a specific computer program, and it's conceivable that there's some very subtle um, structure that we don't know about that somehow forces all these numbers to be not divisible by 101. 
um, and I've no idea how you could possibly prove this. So um, this is an example of a statement in number theory that it's almost obvious that it's true, but we have just no idea how we can actually prove it. Um, I think you know. So someone once said number theory is is a um, a subject where any fool can ask a question that nobody knows how to answer, and th th this is a typical example of such a question. Um, number theory is full of questions like this. Um, now we ha have another question. We've shown there are infinitely many primes, and if you look at the primes, you notice that the last digits, um, the last digit of a prime, must be one, three. Um, seven or nine, uh, unless the prime is two or five, um, because if it's not one, three, seven or nine, the number would have to be divisible by two or five. And if you if you write that out a lot of primes, you see the last digits seem to be roughly equally common. So we can ask, are there infinitely many with last digit one? In other words, are there infinitely many primes of the form 10n plus one? And the answer is yes. This is a very famous theorem proved by Dirichlet, which we will actually discuss later in the course. Um, what I'm going to do now is, is to give a few easy cases of this, or easy variations. So instead of 10n plus 1, we could obviously ask for any, or, any or, other arithmetic progression. We could ask, suppose we're given numbers a and b, are there infinitely many primes of the form a n plus b? Well, they're obviously not if a and b have a common factor, so we should say a and b are, are, are co-prime. Um, and I guess we should also say a is not equal to zero, otherwise you could just take zero times n plus one or something like that. So um, um, there's one easy, well, there, there are some obvious easy cases. If you look at primes of the form 2n plus one, there are obviously an infinite number because you know, all primes except two are of this form. So what about numbers of the form 4n plus 3? Well, what you can do is you can do a, a sort of variation of Euclid's um, proof. What we do is suppose we take some primes of the form p1, p2, up to pk of the form 4n plus 3. Then I'm going to multiply them all together. And then I'm going to multiply this by 4 and subtract 1. So this is of the form 4m plus 3, rather obviously. And we notice this is not divisible by primes p1 up to pk that we found, because if it were, then these primes would divide this number and they would divide that number, and so they would have to divide minus 1. However, it's also not divisible um, entirely by, let me rephrase that, it, it must have at least one factor not of the form 4m plus 3. Sorry, not, not of the form 4m plus 1. That's because the product of these, of any number of factors of these, is also of the form 4 um, m plus 1, as, as we saw earlier. If you, if you multiply numbers of the form 4m plus 1, it's still of the form 4m plus 1. So this must have at least one factor that's not of the form 4m plus 3, and it can't be divisible by 2 either. So, so it must have a prime factor of the form 4m plus 3, and it can't be one of the primes that we've already found of the form 4n plus 3, so there are infinitely many primes of the form 4n plus 3. Um, uh, we can do a similar thing for 3n plus 2, and I'll just leave this as an exercise. There are infinitely many primes greater than positive primes of the form 3n plus 2. Um, um, what about 4n plus 1? Well, this is rather more difficult. The problem is that the product of two primes of the form 4n 
numbers of the form 4n plus 1 is of the form 4n plus 1, which we used earlier. The trouble is if we multiply numbers to, of the form 4n plus 3 together, they don't need to be of the form 4n plus 3, so the previous proof breaks down. Well, we can do 4n plus 1, but we need to use the following fact, that um, if a prime divides m squared plus 1, then then, then then p equals 2 or p is of the form 4n plus 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to prove this later on in the course, but for the moment I'm just going to assume it. And as I said, whenever we have something in number theory, you should always start out by checking the first few cases just to, just to get an idea what's going on. So, so let's look at the numbers m squared plus 1. So we have 1 squared plus 1 is 2, 2 squared plus 1 is 5, uh, that's of the form 4n plus 1. 3 squared plus 1 is 10, which is 2 times 5. 4 squared plus 1 is 17. That's of the form 4n plus 1. 5 squared plus 1 is 26, which is 2 times 13. That's of the form 4n plus 1. 6 squared plus 1 is 37. That's OK. 7 squared plus 1 is 50. So that's 2 times 5 times 5. And you see all the numbers that appear here are always either 2 or of the form 4n plus 1. So I've at least made this statement reasonably plausible. Anyway, now using this fact, we can now um, copy Euclid's proof. Suppose we take some numbers p1, p2, and so on up to pk, where all pk's, where all pi's are of the, of the form 4n plus 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply them together, and I'm going to add 1. But that's no good because I can only show that something is of the form 4n plus 1 if it divides a square. Um, so I can square this, but then um, the, the problem is this might be divisible by 2. So I'm going to get rid of the possibility that this is divisible by 2 by sticking in a 2 here. Um, so we now know that all factors of this are... First of all, they're of the form 4n plus 1 by the result that I um, postponed the proof of till later, that I stated earlier. Secondly, they're not equal to 2. Um, thirdly, they're, um, sorry, they're, they're of the form 4n plus 1 or 2. And I've shown they're not equal to 2 because I stuck a 2 in here. And they're also not equal to p1, p2, up to pk. So they must be new primes of the form 4n plus 1. So we've got infinitely many primes that are 4n plus 1 and infinitely many that are 4n plus 3. Um, well, you can't really push this rather simple idea much further. Um, you can push it slightly further so we can show there are infinitely many primes that are 3 or 7 um, that, that, that have last digit as, as 3 or 7 when written to base 10. And the point is that um, if um, m and n have last digit 1 or 9, um, so th 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 then so does the product. That's m can have last digit 1 or 9, and n can have last digit 1 or 9, and if you multiply them together, the, the result will still have last digit 1 or 9. So if you take something like 10 p1 up to pk plus 3, it must have a prime factor with last digit 3 or 7. So if you take p1 up to pk to be all the primes you've thought of so far with last digit 3 or 7, then a prime factor of this will be, be a new one. The trouble with this is it's very hard to separate these out. So if you, if you want an infinite number with last digit 3 or an infinite number with last digit 7, it's, it's much harder to prove. And, but the, this is what Dirichlet um, managed that we will discuss later. Um, another question you can ask is what about gaps between primes? So if we look at our primes 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 
13, 17, 19, 23, uh, 25, 27, 29. We can see that we sometimes get gaps. So here's a gap of six. Um, here's a gap of four. Here's a gap of one. Here's a gap of two and so on. So the gaps seem to be, I mean, well, they, they, they're sometimes quite small. They sometimes go down to two and they sometimes get a bit big. And we can ask, is there a bound to the gaps? And the answer is no, there's no bound on the gaps. And this is quite easy to see. Let's just take the number n factorial and we can add two or three or four or up to n. And these are not prime. And that's obvious because n factorial plus k is divisible by the number k if um, one less than or equal to k is less than or equal to n. So here we've got um, um, a gap of uh, n minus one numbers that are that, that, that are not prime. So so we notice here that n minus one is slightly less than the log of n factorial. Um, and in fact, it turns out that in some sense the average size of a gap between numbers. Um, so, so if you've got prime numbers up to n, the average size of the, the gap between prime numbers is about the logarithm of n. Um, that actually follows from something called the prime number theorem that I'll discuss later in the course. And it's incredibly difficult to show that the gap is sometimes significantly bigger than this or sometimes significantly smaller than this. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, there's an amazing breakthrough by Zhang that the gap is sometimes less than or equal to 70 million for all large, for large n. Well, of course, it's obvious the gap is sometimes less than 70 million because we found lots of gaps less than 70 million. What Zhang showed is that you get infinitely many um, gaps um, that are less than 70 million. In, in other words, if you if you keep going forever, you you will you, you, you will never get a, the, 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 the gaps between prime, the minimum size of the gaps between primes don't keep increasing. Um, it's believed that the, the, um, there are infinitely many cases when the gap actually is size two. That's the famous twin prime conjecture, but that seems to be way beyond anything we can prove at the moment. Um, this number here has since been reduced to something a bit more reasonable, uh, two or three hundred or something, and will probably come down a bit more. Um, on the other hand, you can ask, can the gap sometimes be bigger than log of n? There's a sort of conjecture um, that the gap is sometimes about log of n squared. So that's about the square of the average size. Um, this seems to be far beyond anything we can prove. Um, let me give you an example of some of the things we can prove. There's, the, the, there's a result by Rankin, who found it in about 1938, which says the gap is sometimes bigger than this rather spectacular. You take a third of log of n, so that's the, 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 that's the sort of log of n is the average size, and then you multiply it by log of log of n, then you multiply it by log, 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 log of n, and then you divide all this by log of n, sorry, log, log, log of n, all cubed. And your reaction when you look at this is probably to say this number is utterly and completely ridiculous. And you're right. Um, um, actually, um, the, the, the thing is log of n increases very slowly. Log log of n increases so ridiculously slowly that it's constant for all practical purposes. And these two terms are even more ridiculous. However, analytic number theorists are really fond of long chains of logs like this. Um, chains of three logs occur reasonably often. Chains of four logs like this are unusual even for analytic number theorists. So, so this really is a, uh, it probably comes close to setting the record for bizarreness of, of bounds in analytic number theory. Um, this has actually been improved very slightly, but 
Um, improvements on this are, are actually extremely difficult to do. Um, um, so um, I think I'll pause there and continue the rest of the lecture on primes in the next video.